I guess. So. Guys, guys, if you'll bear with me one more minute, we're admitting a few other people. Yeah, you're right. It okay. said to hit this hitting this you consent. Okay, um, everyone, if you would please mute um, mute your mute, mute yourselves um, for the program, and then you can unmute when you have questions. Tom, I forgot to ask you. Do you want questions after? Do you want questions in chat or do you, you know, want uh, someone to I'm raise not, their hand? I'll, I'll answer. I guess maybe I'll answer the questions after, but I think okay. just so people don't lose their train of thought, if they want to uh, type them in the chat box, we can just sort of go through them uh, okay. at the end, if that's okay. Uh, but by all means, leave Fine. them there as soon as they occur to you. Okay, guys, if you would type your questions into the chat, we're going to go through them at the end. And people okay. can... I, and people can, I guess, like unmute themselves and ask uh, at the end. I think that would be fine yeah. too. And we yeah. can unmute or you can unmute and ask, but if you want to go and invite it, I mean, um, yeah, sorry. Okay, guys, um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we are so happy to have you. Um, and we're so delighted to welcome Thomas Hines back. Um, he's the author of Wild City and he has done two previous programs for us. As you know, he's a very familiar with all the wild things in the city. Um, he's done a program for us on the birds of New York. He's also done another program for the East End Programmers um, Association on um, gators and other, um, other mythical and not so mythical animals of New York. He's going to talk to us tonight about oysters, which have been a huge part of New York City history from the time Henry Hudson sailed in over, was it 220,000 acres of oyster beds, which were soon depleted, right? Because yes, I believe was that's right. Oysters. Um, and, but oysters are making a comeback and he's gonna talk about the history, the impact on the city and um, how they're making a comeback. And before we proceed, I want to thank the other uh, participating libraries in the Easton, um, uh, Library, so Easton Library Programmers Association, Amagansett, Patchogue, New Suffolk, Hampton Bays, Hampton Library, Mattituck Laurel, North Shore Public Library, Port Jeff, Quag, Riverhead, South Hold and Montauk. Thank you so much for, it's the consortium of all the libraries that make wonderful programs like Thomas's possible. So thank you for joining us and Tom, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Nola. And I'm so happy uh, to be back with all of these libraries. Uh, it's, it's enough uh, of a thrill to do it for one, but the way that you all have uh, gathered up uh, your collective strength is, is great. And I'm glad to, to be a part of it. Um, so for those of you who don't know, my name is Thomas Hines, as this uh, book cover will attest. Uh, I wrote this book here, uh, Wild City, which is a brief history of New York City and 40 animals. Uh, I, you know, did my research and spoke to advocates and scientists and things like that, but it's also a very colorful book as, as I think the cover will, will, uh, well, illustrate. Um, and throughout the book, each one of these 40 animals has a full page illustration and they were all done uh, by the, the, a great artist uh, named Kath Nash, who I had the great uh, advantage and, and opportunity to work with on this. And um, yeah, we'll be seeing, uh, I think some of her work, uh, a little bit more of her work through this. Um, so this book is like, a, you know, it's a fun love letter to New York. It's a surprising history. Uh, of the city uh, as well. And I, I'd like to think that, you know, it's not really like a field guide. It really is uh, telling the story of New York City. It is one of the characters in the book. And to, to undertake uh, any story about the wildlife of New York City, I think, in my opinion, uh, has to include uh, the oyster. I would say it's the most important, uh, one of, if not the most important, uh, animal in the in the history of New York City. They're one of the determining factors in what uh, uh, led New York City to grow to such heights, and uh, is you know also maybe potentially going to play a role uh, in New York City's uh, present and future. So it's it's a you know I think along with the um, with the beaver, the oyster is really uh, something that could not be left out of a book about New York City wildlife. Maybe uh, pigeons and rats would be the other animals that would have to be included. So anyway. Um, We'll move through here and look at some slides as we talk. Uh, this first one is a full page illustration by Kath Nash. This is our oyster chapter. I would say this is probably taken from the vantage point uh, of Governor's Island, um, which will come into play a little bit later. So I like to open these talks with uh, a sort of a step back and uh, taking a look at what <clears throat> New York City and Manhattan and the Greater Harbor 
uh, looked like in 1609. Now, 1609 is a pivotal year uh, in the history of New York City. It's also a pivotal year in, in this book uh, because that's the year that the Europeans arrived uh, through the Verrazano Narrows, uh, Henry Hudson and uh, his Ducks, Dutch expedition. Um, it's important to know that this is not um, uninhabited land. This was Lenape land. Uh, this illustration is not from Wild City, though we have something similar in the book. This is from uh, Eric Sanderson's book, Manahatta. Uh, Eric Sanderson uh, works at the Wildlife Conservation Society, which you may also know as the Bronx Zoo. Um, this will be the first book that I recommend throughout this talk. I, I have two pages at the end of this book with recommended further reading. So I'm all about uh, spreading your wildlife in New York City history, <laughs> a learning beyond the pages of my book. Anyway, so this is a look at how things looked in 1609. We can see it's a little bit more of a narrow island. It's got a bit of a rocky shore, some shallows. Uh, there's also some freshwater sources in the island, including the collect pond, which is what we see right here. Uh, and I think that to, to really think about New York City, uh, uh, it's a pretty ideal harbor. Uh, just geographically, you know, we have uh, these big barrier islands by way of Staten Island and the southern southwestern corner of Long Island, or better known as Brooklyn. Uh, we have these broad navigable rivers. And, it, you know, it's pretty geographically, it's pretty ideal. Um, but it was also ecologically very diverse. As Eric Sanderson wrote uh, in his book, Manhattan. Um, as an example that he likes to illustrate, um, that if New York City, or better yet, North America had been settled uh, or colonized or whatever by the Europeans from west to east, that they had started in California and moved their way here, that by the time they got to New York City, they may have left it as a national park. I mean, it really is, you know, free of people uh, or free of what we've done to it, a pretty spectacular place ecologically. Uh, an example that I like to point out is that Yellowstone National Park, uh, which has 2.2 million acres, has 66 unique ecosystems, uh, which is why it's Yellowstone National Park. However, Manhattan, uh, which in 1609 only had 2,200 acres, uh, had 55 ecosystems within it. So it's, it's not enough to say that it could have been a national park. It would have been the jewel of the national park system. Um, and one thing that, uh, one natural advantage that New York City had a whole lot of, of course, was oysters. Um, by one estimate, they had half the world's oysters lived in uh, these waters that extend from Sandy Hook down here in New Jersey into Jamaica Bay, up uh, through the beginning of Long Island Sound, the end of the East River by the Bronx, and then of course, throughout the Upper Bay and the Lower Bay along the, the, what were then the rocky shores of Manhattan and Brooklyn uh, and all around uh, Staten Island as well. Um, one particularly, uh, surprising anecdote uh, uh, for someone who lives near the Gowanus Canal, such as myself, which of course is the, the EPA Superfund site. It's a toxic mess, though they are doing some, some uh, important work now to remediate it. It's still a pretty dangerous place. It once was the Gowanus Creek, and it uh, was an ideal um, uh, habitat for, for breeding oysters. And by one account, the oysters uh, there would grow to the size of dinner plates. So I like to say that uh, oysters growing to the size of dinner plates in the Gowanus Canal is a sentence that gets more disgusting uh, the longer it goes on. Um, so moving on, you know, New York City was this, was this pretty ideal place uh, for, for a maritime habitat and it was also pretty ideal for commerce. Um, and quickly, European settlers uh, followed that original Dutch, Dutch expedition in New York uh, to New York. And, uh, oysters quickly became uh, a, a, you know, a local delicacy and sometimes rather synonymous with New York City. Um, when we look at the early, early Dutch settlement of Lower Manhattan, I think we'll see a map of it on the next slide. One of the original streets and one that's still there uh, in Manhattan, of course, is Pearl Street. Um, and as I say, uh, long before hot dog carts and halal stands could be found everywhere, uh, oysters were the original ubiquitous uh, food, the original uh, street meat, uh, if you will. And uh, I'll take this opportunity to recommend a second book uh, for anyone who wants to learn more about uh, New York City's uh, history with oysters. Uh, I, would re I couldn't recommend high enough uh, The Big Oyster by Mark Kurlansky. Uh, it's a great read about the subject. The, the one thing I will say is that um, 
it kind of critically misses the third act of what I think is the oyster in New York story just by dint of when it was written. Uh, and there's been like tremendous, uh, the positive uh, developments that we'll get to uh, without giving away too much that we'll get to later in the talk that I think the book was just written before that. So it's just sort of a sad story, uh, uh, Mark Kurlansky's book, but a great one nonetheless. Um, so this is that original Dutch settlement, uh, you know, this tiny little, almost like a, a fingernail on the end of Manhattan. Uh, we can see some early canals and things like that. We see the wall of Wall Street. Um, and, you know, in, in, in time, uh, you know, another thing that we would do is, is we would, you know, this was sort of the original threat to, uh, to oysters uh, was an encroachment on their habitat. So uh, a rocky, shallow, you know, uneven shore is, is very good for uh, oysters and, and, you know, long-legged wading birds like black crowned night herons and things like that. Uh, those rocky shallows are great for ecological uh, diversity, but they're not great for business. Um, and, you know, New York City, as always, has been sort of a real estate uh, town. And so, you know, one thing that we've done over the years is really expand the island outward. Um, and this was happening as recently as I think the last major addition was when the world, the original World Trade Center was being excavated. And that's all Battery Park City now, of course. And what's resulted um, is this, you know, replacing this, this shoreline of marshy rocky shallows with uh, a nearly unbroken string of, of bulkheads and piers and landfill, uh, which again is good for real estate and good for shipping and good for commerce, but bad for marine uh, biodiversity. So uh, the thing about oysters that I, I think is, is, is kind of great is they're, they're rather democratic, uh, at, at least in the, in the earlier uh, decades and centuries of New York. Uh, they were loved by rich and poor alike. They were on menus at the uh, fanciest of banquets, but they were also cheap. There were things like the Canal Street plan, which was all you could eat oysters for six cents. Um, but of course that popularity uh, began to take a toll <laughs> uh, on, on the oyster beds. Uh, and this is, a, I believe, a picture just from, just, uh, just to illustrate the sort of <laughs> the scale of the oyster harvesting. Um, uh, and, you know, New York City was not just eating its own oysters. New York City, never to shy away from a business opportunity, uh, was sending its oysters all over the world. Um, so we begin to really see this, this multi-pronged threat to the oysters. You know, on the one hand, we're encroaching on their territory, and then we're, we're over-harvesting them. Uh, by the early 1900s, uh, oysters, uh, it was about a billion oysters were getting pulled out of New York City Harbor uh, a year. And of course, uh, this was not sustainable. Um, and this is a picture of, uh, of course, one of my favorite places uh, in not just all, just New York City, but maybe all the world, uh, the Grand Central Oyster Bar with the um, iconic uh, Gustavino tiling uh, on the ceiling. So if you're ever, you know, this is one of the things I look forward to uh, when, the, when the quarantine ended was to get back to places like this. Um, so again, this was, you know, this is another picture of, of oyster shells that were just underneath the Manhattan Bridge. Um, Again, just to illustrate that this this pace of consumption and and habitat encroachment uh, was 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 a little bit untenable to to put it mildly. Uh, and then, lastly, uh, the final I think death knell in in the uh, you know the beginning of the of the end for the New York City oyster was uh, waste management or or the lack thereof. I think that this dealt a, a, a devastating and final blow. Uh, to a temporarily final bow to, to New York City's oysters. Um, this is a picture of what was the Gowanus Creek, now the Gowanus Canal. Uh, this is not, <laughs> if you're ever near there, you will know this is not really an oyster uh, friendly habitat, despite the EPA and the city's best efforts to remediate it. It's, uh, we did stuff like this and, and heavy industry on it and, and toxic runoff for, for decades. And so, um, and this was not the only place that we did that. Uh, you know, th this this was uh, taken, I think, in the 1930s, but it wasn't until the Clean Water Act in 1972 that you know we even began to to to, to treat our our millions of gallons of raw untreated sewage, and even still, some of that gets in with with CSO. We'll get to that later, though. Um, by 1921. Uh, things were beginning to look really bad uh, for the oyster beds and you know oyster fisheries were, were, were reporting smaller yields uh, but also the New York City Health Department 
close the entire Jamaica Bay oyster beds, uh, then responsible for 80 million oysters a year uh, due to foodborne illnesses, including typhoid. Uh, and from there, the end came fast. And six years later in 1927, the last of New York City's oyster beds was closed uh, in New Jersey and Raritan Bay. And this is just another slide of uh, just what, you know, New York City's waters kind of looked like uh, at this time. This is Newtown Creek, the body of water that separates Brooklyn and Queens. This is uh, uh, 1937. And of course, one of the city's other uh, super fun sites. And uh, of course, one New Yorker who is synonymous with this ecological neglect and later comeuppance uh, was the Irish cook, Mary Mallon, uh, who came to be known as Typhoid Mary, the original uh, super spreader. Mary was uh, asymptomatic, but infected countless people um, and was blamed for it. Uh, the real culprit, uh, of course, was oysters or better yet, people's waste uh, and that was unmanaged that then tainted the oysters. So this was really a collective failure that, um, uh, if, you can believe, if you can believe it, uh, society blamed a woman for. Um, Malin was sentenced to be quarantined in North Brother Island, uh, which is here, uh, up by Rikers, by the South Shore of Bronx, by LaGuardia, and its own smaller South Brother Island. Uh, it was temporary though, she went back to work, she changed her name. I like to joke that she changed it to uh, Typhoid Gretchen, or maybe uh, Rheumatoid Arthritis Mary, but she didn't, she just changed it to something other that uh, was vaguely Irish. And eventually the authorities caught up to her and she was sent back to North Brother Island where she would live out three decades, of, the final three decades of her life in exile, uh, claiming innocence uh, the entire time. And this is a picture of North Brother Island, um, which I just think is an interesting place. Uh, it's completely off limits. I tried to get a pass to go out there with the parks department under the, the banner of writing a book about New York City wildlife. And they were basically like, good luck with your book, no chance. Um, but it's an, it's an interesting example of a, of a habitat that, that got altered uh, based on our habitat, uh, our altering of another habitat. Basically, uh, we polluted the water so badly that we ruined the harbor and infected countless people with typhoid. Our own pollution created the need for a quarantine hospitals and in this odd and unlikely uh, reversal, North Brother Island eventually itself went back to nature. Uh, and of course, there were lots of, you know, bad, uh, it wasn't just the water that was being polluted uh, in New York City at this time. Uh, this is a, a somewhat iconic picture, I, I, I sadly, I guess, uh, of a 1966 smog event that uh, likely killed 168 people. Uh, this doesn't really impact oysters, but it just is to underline uh, the way things were in New York City, ecologically speaking, uh, at the time. You know, this is, um, I think, synonymous with, you know, not far from the Bronx's burning, uh, you know, suburban white flight, uh, the, the military deindustrialization of the urban centers, and just for lack of all a better term, umbrelling up into, you know, the dark days of New York City. And this is one of the few times that New York City's population had sustained losses, uh, financially, they were a mess, and obviously, ecologically, they were a mess. And, and all of those aren't so neatly tied together, but I definitely think there's some overlap to that. Um, locally, uh, a big moment for New York City's waters uh, came by way of this article from Sports Illustrated uh, that sounded the alarm about pollution uh, as, it, as it manifested with our striped bass. Um, and then, of course, uh, Riverkeeper and Waterkeeper Alliance uh, were sort of born out of this mo moment and uh, in many ways uh, led to the, uh, the passage of the Clean Water Act, the uh, establishment of the EPA in 1970 and the Clean Water Act in 1972, which of course is celebrating its 50th anniversary today or this year. Um, it's in the news today, but not for good reasons. Uh, but if we're gonna, you know, the Clean Water Act has, has had a tremendous uh, impact. And though it is not a light switch, um, you know, it, it has really uh, given New York City harbors and, and American waters, mostly writ large, a, a chance to recover. And, um, you know, like I said, it's not a light switch. It was, I think, 1986 before uh, wastewater uh, management facilities were online. And even still, we, we don't manage all of our, our wastewater uh, in the events, in the events of, of, of heavy rain and things like that. Um, but it has definitely enabled, you know, a, a somewhat tenuous comeback for, for New York City's waters. Um, and leading that charge uh, in, in remediating New York City's waters with the help of the humble oyster uh, 
is my favorite organization, uh, the Billion Oyster Project, uh, who, as their name suggests, are uh, endeavoring to restore uh, one billion oysters uh, to New York City Harbor. And that name uh, comes from a little bit of a, uh, as I call back of the envelope math, uh, that um, based on the fact that one oyster can filter 50 gallons of water a day, uh, that a billion oysters uh, reestablished in New York Harbor could then every three days filter all of the water. Now, that's incredible. Uh, on the one hand, it is a little bit limited because it won't, you know, there's, there's like PFAS and, and heavy metals and, and all kinds of uh, legacy con industrial contaminants that an oyster is not even uh, up to taking to task. But it is a huge, it would be a huge benefit uh, to restore uh, New York City's oyster beds to what they once were. And uh, to date, uh, they've restored 75 million, which I, I wasn't a math major and I'm probably getting this number wrong, but I think that's seven and a half percent of their goal. And at any rate, when I wrote the book, they were only up to 30 million. So they are really, um, are really doing great things. And uh, one thing that I really like it's, is that they are also recycling uh, oyster shells uh, and diverting, uh, as you see here, 1.8 million pounds of shells collected from restaurants that are no longer, uh, you know, getting getting thrown to a landfill, basically. And it's not just that they magically appear in some landfill. Of course, our trash needs to be taken there by diesel fuel and and put in some, you know, environmental justice frontline community that is has no choice but to take our trash. I mean, it's just the way the sooner we can break the landfill cycle and recycle more food, uh, the better it is for New York. And so it's not just enough that Billion Oyster Project is restoring uh, the harbor. Uh, but they're also uh, helping reduce our, 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 our need for fossil fuel and, and landfills, which is great. And then on top of that, they've engaged thousands of students uh, on their, uh, at their school, uh, the New York Harbor School on Governor's Island. So when we saw the illustration earlier, uh, it was from the vantage point uh, of Governor's Island, which I always love because it is sort of the, uh, the, the heart of the you know, New York City oyster restoration uh, efforts. And of course, this is just a side-by-side uh, -side uh, uh, of what an oyster can do. Um, these waters were presumably the same murkiness uh, when the experiment began. And then um, the oysters did their job of filtering the water on the left and the right uh, remained murky and uh, not receiving the benefits of, of oysters. Um, and it's, and it's, this is just a, a picture from the Harbor School uh, from when I was out there. It's, you know, it's, it's pretty great way to engage kids. Um, you just excuse me for one second. I have a dog who'd like to leave the room that we're currently in. Thank you for that, ladybug. Anyway, so uh, it's really just been a, like an incredible organization, and and as I said, you know, Mark Kurlansky's book, The Big Oyster, is required reading. I mean, it's it's fantastic, and he's he's just a brilliant writer and on so many subjects, but his book sort of ends before Billion Oyster Project uh, was established and has, has taken this story on, on, a, on an undoubtedly positive trajectory with you know, realistically a lot of work to do uh, and a lot of uh, challenges ahead. But it is, I think, a much more hopeful story uh, with the work that they're doing. Um, and of course, you know, oh, and these are the, uh, sorry, this is another picture of the oyster restoration reefs, the artificial reefs, these are, uh, they're called oyster gabions. What they do is they, these oyster shells are, are used as substrate uh, or, you know, basically the, the, what uh, oyster larva uh, will attach itself to. And that's replicates how they, you know, uh, propagate in the wild. An oyster doesn't just spring up on itself. It, it springs up on the back of its ancestors, basically. It's, um, and uh, it, it's kind of poetic, actually. It's, it's really great. Um, and so these gabions are built by students. Uh, I did a volunteer day and built one of these uh, one day. And, and the oysters that are in here have been, it's not like they came straight from the restaurant to here. They sit out uh, in a field in, in, on Governor's Island for a year and are sanitized by you know, sunlight, rain, and wind. Uh, that's just sort of the best practices. Um, and this is a, a photograph taken from like about two minutes from my apartment uh, here in Dumbo and just the way that it's engaged children and, and uh, showing a different maritime vocation uh, while at the same time providing this tremendous benefit to New York's 
uh, ecology, even New York's real estate. Uh, uh, when you think about what oysters can do and, and storm protection, we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, it's really just been incredible. And um, it's another picture uh, from Brooklyn Bridge Park, uh, shouting out the Clean Water Act, of course, which was so important and still is. And, but of course there's, there's other people doing uh, great things. Uh, this is um, Kate Orff of Scape Landscapes. Uh, Kate uh, is building what they call living breakwater uh, out on Staten Island, which was particularly hit hard uh, by Hurricane Sandy. So not only will those oysters that they are repopulating uh, have all those same benefits of cleaning the water. And I should also mention uh, attract crabs and fish and other wildlife. Uh, they also can mitigate storm uh, surges. And I, I think it's just as, you know, I was explaining this to uh, a student that if you were to throw a cup of water, you know, across a marble table, the water will just fall. But if you put up a bunch of jagged uh, oyster shell shaped obstructions, of course, the, the energy will kind of be uh, attenuated a little bit. And so it's one of these great natural infrastructure solutions um, that uh, the oyster is providing. And, you know, what's really amazing is like, you really just, just kind of put the oysters there and like kind of leave them alone. And, and the, the benefits of what they can do um, are really incredible. And it's not, it's a new idea, but it's really also a restoration, right? I mean, it's, it's about making New York City more like it was naturally intended to be. And I think that's also very uh, encouraging as well. This is just um, a little bit more information on the living breakwaters just because I think it's so cool. Uh, this is, of course, the southern edge of Staten Island. This is Tottenville. Um, if anybody saw the Ken Burns movie about Benjamin Franklin, this is this right here is where Benjamin Franklin negotiated with the British Admiral after the Battle of Long Island, but we digress. These really we're here to talk about are these little dots here, these little artificial oyster reefs off the coast of Staten Island. And you know this area was hit, like a lot of New York City was hit really hard by Sandy. Um, and so, you know, we can build a bigger, I, I, I just think having a solution that nature has already sort of considered and figured out uh, is definitely worth betting on. And uh, I just love this next two slides because, I mean, this is cool anyway, because it kind of shows uh, us what is happening with the energy and also just, uh, you know, wildlife that's being attracted to it. And this is an artist rendering, of course, but they have nice little harbor seals out here, uh, you know, maybe uh, ambitious to think. However, just earlier this, this week, uh, a harbor, harbor seal showed up on their first installation. Uh, so I guess if you build it, uh, they will come. And I, 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 the, I just, <laughs> I added this slide uh, just today because this just happened and I thought, I think there's a seal in that artist rendering and, and sure enough, they, they anticipated this. Um, and New York Restoration Project is uh, another great organization in New York that is um, you know, out there doing, doing some, some, oyster, some oyster projects. Uh, NYRP was, was founded by Bette Midler. Uh, they, they rehab community gardens in vacant lots all over the city, which is just such its own gift. Uh, but they also were planting oysters in Northern Manhattan. So they, this is, uh, I think Sherman Creek, it's, this is the Harlem River here. I, I don't recall exactly where it is, but just to illustrate that there's a lot of people out there uh, doing this work. Um, and, you know, I think that's important um, because there are still many threats uh, to oysters and to all of New York City's uh, water. And um, I think the, the biggest threat uh, or one of the biggest threats is our combined sewer overflow system and not to be, uh, you know, impolite, but it is sort of a uh, uh, unfortunate reality about New York City that, and many cities, most cities, that uh, anytime it rains, uh, our stormwater uh, combines with raw sewage from our toilets and uh, then overflows uh, from outlet points throughout the city. They're everywhere. Um, and it's, it's, it's just something that, you know, the Clean Water Act, even with all its uh, great work. I can't fully account for as it stands. Um, there are a lot of things we can do, but it's, we kind of hit the reset button on some, in some way, every time it rains. Um, but there is a lot more we can be doing to protect the waters. Uh, 
And uh, one of them that I am very interested in is uh, uh, daylighting. And so this is an old map of New York City, this little rectangle uh, superimposed over a current map of New York City. This uh, little shape right here, uh, this body of water that sort of elbows down into the Hudson River. This is the Mineta Brook. It runs uh, right along the, the bended elbow of, of Mineta Street. Uh, this originates up here in about Flatiron and then terminates out here in the Hudson River. And, you know, this is probably not going to be daylighted. And I should, I should back up and say that daylighting is, um, you know, this, this stream uh, is still running essentially because you can't turn off a stream. A stream is just, uh, you know, topography and, and weather. Uh, there, that's hydrology. There's no, there's no real way that the water kind of goes where it wants. Um, so what we do is we put it in the sewer, uh, you might say needlessly, because then that water is uh, that is running in our sewers because that's where we want, that's where we're forcing that water to go. That water is now uh, combining with the sewage and adding to those CSO events. Um, so this was, this was Mineta. It's probably not likely that this will be daylighted and re re returned back above uh, onto street level as daylighting uh, suggests. But there is a candidate for daylighting uh, in, the, in the Bronx, um, running from Van Cortlandt Park uh, to Harlem River. And uh, this is another poorly superimposed map, but um, <clears throat> right up here where my cursor is, uh, this is Van Cortlandt Park. And uh, originally this, this brook called the Tibbetts Brook used to meander its way down until it finally met uh, Spite and Dival, Harlem River and Hudson River. And, and today, uh, it is, there's a lake here at the bottom of Van Cortlandt Park and then sort of a drop off into a sewer where the, where the lake water falls into to the tune of four to five million gallons a day of clean, relatively clean, uh, freshwater brook uh, that is then sent to be needlessly treated at a wastewater uh, treatment plant. Uh, so, you know, all the infrastructure and maintenance and upkeep uh, therein. Uh, however, it also, uh, combines with all that storm water and on extreme weather events and adds to the CSO output in this area. Uh, so this is a candidate for, for being um, daylighted. Uh, this is the tunnel that it goes into. It's a beautiful tunnel, the Broadway tunnel, um, but it's not necessary. And here's what it looked like during Hurricane Ida. This is the Deegan Expressway. And when these pictures happened, and I think it was a wake up call for a lot of New Yorkers, um, one of the thoughts was that the, the Deegan had flooded, but another thought was that the Tibbetts Brook had, had daylighted itself. And there are some user generated photos on Twitter and things of people who went to the, where the Tibbetts Brook is supposed to go into the sewer and saw it really just sort of expressing itself out onto uh, the major Deegan Expressway. This is, an illustration, uh, not from the book, just I'm not even sure where this is from, but of what the Tibbetts Brook could look like. And it doesn't replace the Deegan Expressway. In fact, there is a corridor of unused rail line that currently runs 95% of, of the way that, that could make the Tibbetts Brook possible again. It's all unused green space as it is, it's overgrown. And the owner of these tracks is the CSX Corporation. They have yet to commit in the way that the city would like them to. However, there is some precedent with this organization. Uh, the tracks that they donated in Manhattan later became the High Line. So this could be a great benefit. I wrote about this uh, in sort of the closing pages uh, of Wild City about things that possibly maybe could happen in the future. But this one seems to be possible. And I think Hurricane Ida really opened people's eyes. And you know, this is a project that would save us money on infrastructure, it would save us money uh, on pollution costs and cleanups by not combining 5 million gallons a day with the CSO equation. However, it would also provide this great benefit uh, to New Yorkers, this, this green space, this, this wildlife connection between Van Cortlandt Park, which is one of the biggest parks in the city, to the Harlem River, and you would reduce uh, the urban heat island impact. I mean, there's, there's so many good things that could come out of this. And it's just a thing that I kind of repeat 
when I think about New York City park projects, because I think New York City should green itself even more than it has, uh, the thing that I keep coming back to, the mantra that I keep falling back on is, it's never been a bad investment. No one's ever built a park and said, God, I wish we hadn't built this park. This park is terrible. No one goes to the High Line and says, oh, they should, they should re-abandon it. You know, it's, it's always a good investment. And uh, there's, there's almost, you know, there's costs and there's, there's considerations, but there's usually very little downside in, in building a park, though there is always fierce opposition, it seems. But this one looks like it's going from pipe dream to reality. And I think it would really be one of the premier daylighting examples in the world. There's one in Seoul, uh, South Korea, which replaced a highway and it's been a huge success. And there's one in Yonkers, not far actually from the Tibbetts Brook, just across uh, the city limits uh, north of the Bronx. So it's not unprecedented, but it would be a, a really great move for New York City from a hydrology standpoint. And again, I'm just gonna shout out another book. Uh, it's The Hidden Waters of New York City, 101 Forgotten Lakes, Ponds, Creeks, and Streams in the Five Boroughs by Sergei Kandinsky. So you can see the cover is that, that image I cribbed of the um, Mineta Brook. This is just a, fa a fascinating book. And uh, I, I reference it all the time. I love this book. I, I can't, well, I recommend them all, obviously. Another way that New York City can, can help uh, mitigate CSO and protect oysters and protect this incredible maritime uh, habitat that we have uh, is rain gardens. This is a very simple, elegant solution. It's not going to do everything that we need to do, but you know, any water that we can keep from going into the sewer and capturing is water that won't combine with our raw sewage. And so I always say that when it comes to raw sewage, going into our waterways, every drop really counts. And this would have the added benefit of providing vegetation. They say that streets that have trees on them report less crime, lower anxiety, higher, you know, it's, the trees are this, another incredible natural cheap solution that can solve a multitude of problems. Uh, and one way to green up New York further is to, is to plant these rain gardens. And they of course have the added benefit of mitigating CSO. It's just another look at what, uh, at what they're talking about here. And uh, uh, finally, uh, another, I think this is the last <laughs> of my <laughs> harebrained solutions to New all of New York City's problems, but uh, this is a rooftop farm, not a rooftop garden. This is a active farm. This is Brooklyn Grange in Navy Yard, Brooklyn, not far from where I am Zooming with you tonight. Uh, this is the whole roof of a, you know, previously decommissioned Naval Office building that has been turned into this five acre farm. And it produces tens of thousands uh, of pounds a year of, of, of local produce. And they also do weddings and yoga classes and class, other classes and they're just the best. And they also capture a ton of rainwater. And in that process, they're providing local food that doesn't have to be shipped in via diesel powered fossil fuels and, and whatnot. It's, it's locally produced, it captures rainwater, it'll reduce the temperature costs or, and heating and energy costs of this building. This, every roof in New York City should have this. Um, this is a pullback view, I think of another one of their facilities in Sunnyside, Queens. They have three, they have three huge facilities, one in Sunnyside, Queens, one in uh, Navy Yard, and then one in Industry City. And they also do private uh, jobs. So the headquarters of Vice Public uh, Media in, in Williamsburg has a Brooklyn Grange uh, rooftop. There's a roof not far from where I'm calling you, just on my block that has one. So they do work all over New York City. But uh, ultimately, if we can capture this stormwater and put it to other uses, I think you know, we would have a cleaner habitat for New York City. We'd have all these other great benefits. And uh, it would also you know, be great for, for our, our friend, uh, the humble oyster. And so with that, I think we ended a little bit earlier because I was just very jazzed talking about this. I want to thank you and uh, open this up for any questions you might have. This is, of course, oh, this is, of course, is me on Governor's Island uh, doing my, <laughs> my vocational research of, of creating oyster habitats uh, with the Harbor School. And they were kind enough to have me out there. And if anybody's looking for a way to spend a a spring afternoon, I, I recommend uh, spending a day volunteering with them. It, it's, a, it's a great experience and, and you're doing your part for, for the clean future of New York City. 
And again, uh, this is the book Wild City. Uh, we have a Instagram and Twitter, and I think on Facebook too, at Wild City NYC. And um, I just, I, it's so much fun talking to everybody tonight. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Tom. Tom, I think there are questions over in the chat. If you yeah, let me see that. Can, yeah. over there now. Okay, and I just want to point out that this book is available um, as an ebook and as a book through your libraries, as well as through your local bookstores. So support your local bookstores and your local libraries. Okay. So I, I may have uh, covered this, but the, the first question I have is, where do the shelves go, and how are they recycled? So there are hundreds of New York City restaurants that are participating with Billion Oyster Projects specifically on this. And they do weekly pickups and just whenever they clear the table, the oysters go in one bucket and the trash and the recycling goes somewhere else. Uh, they do weekly pickups. They are in a dump truck, basically a huge dump truck brought once a week to Governor's Island. They are left in these huge piles that, as I mentioned, sit outdoor in the element, uh, outdoors in the elements for a year. So the thinking is that a year's worth of sunshine and UV rays, a year's worth of wind and rain will then sterilize uh, the oysters, shells. And from there, simultaneously, there is this gigantic cauldron, you couldn't put your arms around, it goes floor to ceiling, a uh, tank of oyster spat, uh, baby oyster larvae, if you will, that are being I mean, this is above my pay grade. I don't really know the full science of what's happening in that tank, but I've seen it. I know where it is. And the oysters are bonded with the, uh, the shells. Because as I mentioned, one oyster doesn't just pop up in a field under the sea. They, they grow on top of their ancestors, essentially. And they, they pile up in this way. Uh, and that's how oyster beds are made. And so using an oyster that's from the, the oyster bar or you know, your local bar here in Brooklyn, um, is, is a great, it is, a, it is not a substitute in a way. It's exactly what they would do in the wild. And we're just sort of building an oyster project is sort of reintroducing that, that marriage once again. And uh, what do they do with the shells? How are they recycled? I think we just w sort of went there. If oysters filter the water, uh, then the harmful proteins are inside the oysters, which we eat. Absolutely, Sandra. And that is a critical thing to mention that um, I, I think I may have left out that Though oysters are in our harbor, we are not, there is no plans to eat local oysters, uh, nor should they be, uh, for the foreseeable future. The benefits are obviously you know, multiple for them to not be, you know, harvested, but I think also it would be bad for people's health. So they're, they, you know, we want to leave them that, down there to do their thing, but I, I don't think that local oysters are, are going to be uh, consumed uh, anytime soon, not by me anyway. Um, is there a natural or non-toxic way to offset the sewage, maybe like septic systems? Um, I'm not sure if that would work to scale in a place like New York City. I think that the real solution is, yeah. You know, well, there's a few. One, you rebuild the entire sewer system and separate them so that storm water goes in one and, and sewage goes in the other. Uh, that's probably not going to happen. And to be fair, when these sewer systems were built in the 1900s, sewage was on the street and that was a problem. So combined sewers really solved a major health crisis in its day. We're at the point now where it continues to create problems that maybe we don't need. And we're also at the point now where climate change is making extreme weather events more common. Hurricane Ida, I think, really brought that home for me at least. And the most natural immediate solution uh, to mitigate CSO, I think, is to, or sewage waste as you put it, is to keep as much water as you can from getting into that equipment, storm water, rain water, get, get as much as, capture as much as that as you can before it goes uh, into the sewer. And, and, and you know, rain gardens, uh, rooftop gardens, things of that nature, replacing uh, asphalt in everywhere you can with grass. I mean, that, that alone would be a huge benefit. Um, so when we talk about open streets in New York City and these car-free days, and uh, I, I have another proposal in the book that Broadway should be completely car-free from Columbus Circle to Union Square. 
And that would be a great park, but that would also capture a lot of rainwater in New York City. That would, you know, keep a lot, every acre that's, that's grass and not asphalt uh, is an acre where the water's not just like flying right off it into the sewer. It's being absorbed naturally and then providing all those other great benefits. Um, yes, New York City is working with researchers to figure out how to use the ribbed mussel as a natural filter, similar to the oyster, but a preferred species given it's not consumed by humans. That's right. Uh, Prime, preliminary results show that the muscles can filter out fecal coliform bacteria very effectively. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I, this sounds like what they have at Fresh Kills Park, which of course used to be the Fresh Kills uh, uh, landfill. And um, yeah, the, the zebra mussels, I think is what they have. But the idea is that people won't eat them. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, one small clothing brand is about the history of oysters inspired by the book, The Big Oysters. Please check out the history of salty people and our website at saltypeople.com. You got your plug in. <laughs> uh, Liz says that my great grandfather was an oyster man in New York in the early 1890s. That's awesome. Beach Club always used oyster shells in the parking lot until the DEC said we couldn't. Uh, thank you, Liz. I appreciate that. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's, I don't know if we have any other questions, but let me see if there's another. Oh, wait, there's one more. Let's just let me get back to it. And Pat says that she's most familiar, or Pat says they are most familiar with the estuaries of Eastern Long Island, the clams, mussels, and hopefully the scallops, but I'm not encountering any wild oysters. I think there were oyster beds out there. Um, yeah, I, I think that oysters, because uh, you know, I grew up in Stamford, Connecticut. I know that oysters were, were, were up there. They're up in Norwalk. They're in Martha's Vineyard. They're in Cape Cod. They're in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so I think oysters are pretty, Virginicus, I forget the, the Latin name, um, it's in the book, but th th those oysters are pretty much up and down the Eastern seaboard. And I know there are different oysters out West and, and different variations, uh, you know, all over, but um, yeah, I think oysters would be out on the end of Long Island for sure. Mount Sinai Bay. Most of the Long Island came from the Great South Bay. There you go, yeah. <clears throat> That's it, Crasto. Yeah, that's it, Crasto virginica. Yeah, and, and every <laughs> every animal in the book uh, at the at the top of its page uh, has its Latin name and its collective noun because uh, there's some real fun uh, collective nouns um, for some of these animals, uh, especially birds. Birds seem to have the best one, like a an, or, or here's one: an embarrassment of pandas, uh, a colony of penguins a paddling of mandarin ducks. So definitely some, some information in the book, even though I may have forgotten the exact Latin uh, <laughs> when put on the spot. But again, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much. If anybody wants to take themselves off mute and ask a question, please feel free. Um, I am uh, very happy to have, have been back with my friends at, at all these great libraries out on the east end of, of New York, of Long Island. Thank you so much. Um, all of the libraries of the East End, including West Hampton, thank you. Um, we hope you'll join us again. We were already talking about maybe some future programs. Absolutely. And we'd love to hear from you guys also if you have some thoughts on that. And um, I was going to say, oh, we recorded this and it's going to be posted on the West Hampton Library YouTube page Fantastic. in April. So yeah, let okay. me know. I'd love to see it. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll share it as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all so much. The book's called Wild City, and I'm so happy to be here with you tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was good. Can't wait to read the book. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>